Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Trey Johnson, and welcome to our monthly lecture series, Museum After Hours. We have a once-in-a-lifetime program lined up for you all this evening. Author Sherry Green worked closely with World War II survivor Mildred Schindler Jansen to tell her incredible story of growing up in Nazi Germany. Green's book, Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin, uses original photographs and documents to recount Mildred's meticulous memories of how her family's quiet farm life changed dramatically during Hitler's reign. A month before Mildred's 16th birthday, her family was captured by Russian soldiers and forced from their home. Their perilous journey was filled with emotion as Mildred's father was taken by soldiers and later as Mildred herself was separated from her mother and brother. Sherry Green is an author, singer, and speaker from Jackson, Mississippi. Green met a family member of Mildred's while traveling in Germany, and in 2019, Green made the trip to Kansas to interview and record hours of interviews with Mildred, the results of which Green will be highlighting for us this evening. As Green outlines the book's story for this Museum After Hours program, 94-year-old Mildred Schindler Jansen will be present along with her daughter, Susan, to answer any questions from the audience. So be sure you stick around until the end. So let's all give a warm welcome to Sherry, Susan, and Mildred. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Trey. It's a joy to get to be with you tonight. All right, let me get... Uh... Hey, Mildred. <laughs> Hello, Mildred. All right, let me get your PowerPoint up and running here. All right. All right, I'll move this out of the way. Can you see that all right? I can. I can. Thank you for joining us tonight um, for the program Intrepid, One Teen's Courage in a Time of War. And Mildred and I are very excited and honored um, to get to be here with you tonight um, via the wonders of the internet. Next slide, please. As Trey shared, my name is Sherry Green, and it was my honor and privilege to tell the story of Mildred Schindler Jansen, and you will also be delighted um, to be with her later. Um, next slide. This is the cover of Mildred's book, um, Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin, One Woman's Remarkable Escape from Nazi Germany. And we um, just feel very fortunate to have found Sunbury Press. Uh, they're out of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, but they are our publisher and have just been a wonderful partner in sharing this story. Um, the book's been out um, a little over three years now. It debuted in November of 2020. Um, next slide, please. Mildred's story is set against the backdrop of World War II, and most of you probably are very familiar with that story. I am a retired history teacher myself, but just to go back over, this is such a complex subject and just such a wealth of information that is out there about it, but sort of some of the major um factors that set up World War II. First of all, would have been Germany's loss in World War II and just sort of a lot of shame and ignominy on the world stage. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles that would have been signed June 28th of 1919 after that marked actually the formal end of the war, but forced Germany to pay reparations. Uh, there was also loss of territory, enormous restrictions on the buildup of future military, um, I guess, enhancements. And so that was sort of another um, hurt a wound there. There also is a worldwide economic depression that will start here in the United States in 1929. We know it in our history books as the Great Depression, but that will soon um, circle the globe and um, spread throughout Europe. Also, you'll see the rise of fascism in Europe. Um, and a very dictatorial style of government. Um, among those that you would know during this time period, Mussolini in Italy and also Franco in Spain. Also during this time, you're gonna see Hitler rise to power and fill a vacuum of leadership of a sort that is there. Um, 
promise a lot of things, but also start playing the blame game. And this is where you see the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany during this time period, the late 1920s, early 1930s. And then on the world scene, in terms of other nations interacting with Germany, you see a lot of appeasement. We see this mainly with Great Britain and some of her allies. It's basically, this peace at any cost um, is a form of diplomacy that did not play very well. Next slide, please. World War II was almost seven and a half, seven years, um, not quite, 1939 to 1945. And, um, you know, the Axis powers, sort of the, the bad guys, if you want to wear it that, the Black Hats and the White Hats, Germany, Italy, and Japan, and the Allied powers, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And remember, again, the United States does not enter until sort of the last years of the war, we are attacked at Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and we will declare war very shortly thereafter. Next slide, please. Hitler, um, I think a lot of times, I guess for me as a former history teacher, when I think of his name and World War II, I immediately go to the Holocaust, which you cannot discuss World War II without discussing that subject. But before Hitler gets to that point with the final solution, he also has a, another sort of diabolical scheme before that. Um, the German word is Lebensraum, which means living space. This actually was something that had been a part of German culture since the late 1800s. It was a part of sort of the war plan during World War I. But as you can see from that map, all those countries marked in red would have been occupied by Nazi Germany during World War II. There will be 11 of those countries in all, from um, the Anschluss in Austria in 1938, all the way to um, Greece will be the final um, occupied nation in 1941. But if you remember, um, you know, Hitler had this um, fantasy of a master race and wanted to make sure that there was enough um, space, physical space for all the of uh, the people in the Third Reich to live. And so this is where this comes into play. Next slide. The soldiers that will invade the Schindler farm um, on February the 1st, 1945, they will be part of the military offensive that is known in Soviet military history as the Vistula Oder Offensive. And it's about a three and a half week push into Eastern Germany from January the 12th to February the um, 2nd, 1945. We don't know. There was a lot. There was a lot of research, obviously, that went into the writing of this book. But from what we can determine of looking through military records, we surmise that the first Belarusian army group would have been the soldiers in that um, unit would have been the soldiers that basically tore down the door um, of the Schindler farm that day. Marshal Georgi Zukov would have been obviously the man at the top. He would not have been on ground that day. Um, next slide. You know, in every good story, you've got elements. Who, what, when, where, um, what, and how, and Mildred's is no different. Next slide, please. The who of this story, this is the Fritz Schindler family. And this is Mildred's father, Fritz, on the left, and her mother, Anna, who, or Anna, who would also go by the name Mutti. And that, if you've read the book, you will know her by that name. That is the more endearing term in German for mother. Like maybe in English, we would say mommy rather than mom or mother. And so that is what her um, daughter and son called her. And that is the way she's referred to lovingly throughout the book. Um, I love this picture of the Schindlers in front of their home in Radak. Um, this is the only surviving photograph of this family. Next slide, please. The what of this story um, the Schindler family were captured by Russian soldiers and driven from their home. Next slide. This will occur on Thursday, February the 1st of 1945. Um, 
any literary buffs out there, this will be the inciting incident in the book that will set all the other wheels in motion for what is to come. Next slide, please. The where of this story is Radak, Germany. Um, the illustration here is found in the front of Mildred's book if you have read it or check it out from a library or maybe read it on your Kindle. Um, and you can see where Berlin is there. And Radak actually, modern day, is in Poland. It was lost um, per some conditions of the Potsdam Conference. We'll talk about that in just a little while. Next slide, please. This story is important um, for many reasons, but the five, Mildred and I have had a lot of fun in the last couple of months. I was in Kansas in October, and we had a wonderful occasion to speak to several school groups of junior high and high school students, but especially for the next generation, for all of us, but especially, I think, for younger um, readers or listeners of this story. First of all, Mildred's story tells us that the events of history are personal and they really do happen to real people. I remember as a history teacher, a lot of kids used to tell me, um, you know, why do I need to know these dates or these people are dead and they've been gone for 300 years, but they were here and they were real just like you and I are. This story also teaches that history can and does repeat itself. And you don't need me to tell you, you can look at your six o'clock broadcast or read your morning newspaper and see that a lot of this history is unfortunately repeating itself in the wider world around us. Mildred's story also enables us to understand what others in war-torn countries might be going through in the present time. And as you know, within the last two years on the, on the world scene, we've had war breakout in Ukraine and within the last three months in Israel. Also, Mildred's story offers a glimpse into the life of a teenager that is very similar to that of a 21st century teen. Technology is the game changer, certainly, between now and 1945, when Mildred was 15. But other than that, people put their pants on the same way, one leg after the other, and not a whole lot new in the world that way. But I think more importantly, Mildred's story is important because it provides an example of courage that all of us might need in a difficult time. Next slide, please. Mildred's story is um, unique for several reasons. The, the first of these, and probably the most important, is that she is a U.S. citizen who was born in this country to German immigrant parents in 1929. Um, a lot of uh, memoirs and biographies or, or autobiographies that you read coming out of this period are in the voice of um, other nationalities, of people that have come, maybe immigrated to this country, but were not actually U.S. citizens. Next slide, please. Mildred's account, she is a Gentile. Most um, female voices, if you read... Um, autobiographies or memoirs from this period are written by um, Jewish voices. And Mildred grew up evangelical Lutheran. This is her church in Radak. The building is still there today. Um, and most of the, in terms of the Protestant denominations in Germany during the, that time period, the early 1930s um, on into the 1940s, the northern part of the country in which she lived would have been predominantly evangelical Lutheran. Next slide. For me, especially as a former history teacher, Mildred's story is very important because it helps us understand that not all Germans supported Hitler. I think it is very easy for whatever historical period you're thinking about um, to say that, well, everybody did this and such. Well, they did not. And the, the Schindler certainly were not supporters of Hitler. Next slide, please. Mildred's story is also unique that it is set against the backdrop of the end of World War II. As I mentioned, I was a former history teacher uh, in another career taught 20 years in the classroom, and I taught a lot of times this World War II story, but it is such a vast amount of information, and so I had to become a student and learn this because I did not know this Soviet story, sort of these last three months of the war. Next slide, please. 
Mildred's story is also a remarkable account of God's protection. And if you are a person of faith, you will see his fingerprints scattered all over the pages of Mildred's story. Next slide. Thankfully, Mildred and her mother were spared assault by the Russian soldiers. This was some of the first data I think I started researching after um, Susan, her daughter, contacted me in, the, in August of 2019. But the statistics on the assault of women by Russian soldiers is horrifying. Over 2 million women were assaulted in that three-month period. And so we were very thankful that did not happen to Mildred nor her mother. Next slide. As Trey mentioned earlier, there were over 100 original photographs and documents that I had access to that the family had lovingly um, kept or saved or received from other family members. And so as a historian myself, this was an absolute delight, but the book is full of these. And that I think also helps bring Mildred's story to life. Next slide. Mildred's story is also unique. Uh, we've been told by a Holocaust educator that this is the only account of a survivor that that individual knows of someone who su survived three occupation forces, uh, the Nazis, the Russian Red Army, and the Polish Army. Next slide, please. Mildred's mother, Mutti, <laughs> um, how I wish I knew her. Um, just remarkable lady, but she was very creative. But as soon as the family was rounded up with all the rest of the residents of Radok and had herded east into Poland, this is where the Russians were eventually going to take all these people. And then obviously, as they reached other towns, more and more people joined this entourage. But Mildred's mother, Muti, would get up every morning early and put flour on her face, rub lard on her neck, and then wrap a cloth tightly around her neck, almost where Mildred could not um, turn her neck to make her very unattractive, so to speak. But that helped a lot. Next slide. One morning, however, the Russian soldiers came before Mutti had been able to apply the, the disguise, so to speak. And so Mildred was taken with a group of about 30 young women from um, the prisoners and taken to a Russian laundry camp and did not know as that wagon pulled away with her and these other women in it, if she would ever see her mother and her brother again. Next slide, please. While Mildred was in the laundry camp, um, that would have been about three and a half weeks. There would have been no way to bathe because there were male soldiers that stood there and watched your every move. So you just rinsed your face off in an animal trough, basically, and washed your hands. Um, all these young women were covered in lice, again, which is very common when you have lots of um, people together and not a lot of sanitation. Mildred also, the, their sleeping arrangements, they basically were bunks formed from boards that were hammered into the wall with supports. Luckily, she was able to get a top bunk or scamper up on to one before another young woman grabbed it. And so I think this also helped her. But at the end of three weeks, we think this is somewhere late April of 1945. Mildred was able, these young women are told that they can go. The Russians are now going to head toward Berlin. And so Mildred, along with um, several other young women, sets out. This, to me, is one of the miraculous parts of this story. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. But she was able to find her mother and her brother, and they do make their way back to the farm in Radok. Next slide, please. When they get back, this would have been early May of 1945. The house is still standing. It is basically in ruins, though. All of their physical possessions are gone. There's mold everywhere. Their home, like the houses where Mildred had been um, at the laundry camp, had also been used as a laundry facility. Holes had been bored in the floor and in the walls. Um, but as soon as Mutti gets there with her children, she takes them down into the basement, which had a brick floor. This was under the, the this would have been a subterranean level of the main home. But um, it was obvious the Russians had torn up the floor looking for an, any hidden objects, but in a corner of the room. 
Um, there are about 10 or 15 bricks just sort of lumped together and Mutti bends down and picks up one and underneath it is a canvas bag that her husband Fritz had carefully hidden. We do surmise that Fritz and Mutti knew this might happen and the soldiers were coming. Of course, they never told their children that. There will be um, money in the bag, which of course now is useless. There will be family jewelry. There will be Mutti and Fritz's marriage certificate. There'll be the deed to the Schindler farm. But the most important treasure that will be there is Mildred's um, United States birth certificate. Also during this time, again, this is May 1945, the Schindlers, uh, Mildred and Mutti, her mom and Horst, her brother, will stay at the farm all that summer. Um, remember, this is home and they are farmers, so they know how to bring the land back to life and they will plant lettuce and find seeds and begin to make a garden again. But sadly, the very end of the summer, we think somewhere maybe early August, it'll be right after the Potsdam Conference, which would have been um, mid-July to early August of 1945. And if you remember that from your history books, Poland is given a lot of German land that would have been taken from her much earlier during the war. And so the Schindler farm is within that boundary. So the three of them look up, Mildred and her brother rather, look up one day to find Polish soldiers with guns drawn on them. And the men tell them that they basically have a day to decide whether they want to stay. If they do, they have to learn to speak Polish and become Polish citizens. And of course, the Schindlers say, no, thank you, and decide to leave the next day. So they make their way to Berlin. Next slide. They will travel to Berlin where there are relatives. Um, Mildred's father's sister lives there. And Mildred has a cousin, children of this family, but the Schindlers are not able to stay in Berlin immediately. They're going to be taken to Nienhagen, which was another displaced persons camp on the northern coast of Germany. And if you remember your history, at the end of the war, Germany is divided into four zones, occupation zones, the Soviet, the American, the French, and the British. And Mutti had begged personnel in Berlin not to send them into the Soviet zone, um, but that's exactly where they're sent. And so um, once they get into Nienhagen, Mutti starts noticing train loads of young women that are being taken from this town and sent into Siberia. And the mayor of that town, I think this is another part of God's providence in this story, but he um, was the one you had to get the train ticket from and permission to leave. But Mutti comes up with another ruse and she asked him for a ticket to allow Mildred to go to Berlin um, to go get winter clothing from extended family and bring it back. And he allows her to go. This I can well remember Mildred being in your kitchen, and I think I'm very literal sometimes. But I was, I, it took me a while to figure out that the winter clothing were really not there at all. Um, but this will be the way that Mutti protects her daughter. And there's a very poignant scene in the book. I think it's one of my favorite where Mildred puts her step on that train and will not see her mother and brother for years after that point. When Mildred gets back to Berlin. She will be with her aunt and her cousin Voltrod actually works at the American consulate. And so she takes Mildred with her and Mildred's mother, before she had left Nienhagen, had pinned um, the American birth certificate to the inside of Mildred's undergarment and just said, you take care of this. You may need this. And once the consulate sees what it is, um, that will set in motion another set of events that will bring Mildred to the United States. That passport, um, that birth certificate rather, will become her passport home. Next slide, please. Unbeknownst to Mildred, um, in December of 1945, President Truman will sign an executive order that comes to be known as the Truman Directive that basically will become a plan to bring Americans or people with American ties that are either refugees or displaced persons in Europe to bring them back to the United States. It will not be until almost a year later in December of 1946 when he will actually 
assign four ships and begin the expedition of this plan. And one of these is the ship there in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, the SS Marine Marlin, that will bring Mildred um, back to the United States. Um, the funds for her trip were provided by Travelers Aid International, and this is still a wonderful organization. In fact, they were so very helpful to us during the writing of the book. Um, and they have been around, I want to say, in, since the late 1800s. But their mission has always been to help people that did not have the funds, especially women or younger um maybe teens. And so Mildred certainly was in that number, but we are thankful for their provision to help her get back to the States. Next slide, please. Once Mildred gets here, she will travel alone, um, sailing again into New York Harbor past the Statue of Liberty, which that was, I think, thinking about Mildred um, was one of the things that made my heart swell. But talking to Mildred later, I remember she was saying that at the time, the Statue of Liberty did not register with her like it did maybe with me growing up as a child here. But Mildred will travel by train and meet another family member, another of her father's sisters, Anna, and her husband, Charlie Herb, who own a farm in Kansas, in Great Bend, Kansas, and their daughter, Margaret, will become a dear friend. This is Mildred on the Herb farm there in the story. I mean, in, in your slides. But she will come to live with them in the early spring of 1947. She will be with them a number of months and then realize that she needs to learn English. Now, remember, even though she is an American citizen, German is her primary language because from the time she was six months old, she was back in Germany. So it's almost as almost like an ESL student learning English as a second language now. But she will take a job in a diet kitchen in Great Bend and live there on the grounds of the hospital, um, almost like immersion for foreign language, but will be working on her English. And a young nurse there, an American nurse, Dorothy Harder, who's a few years older than Mildred, who is fluent in German, was not German herself, but had an affinity for um, second languages and becomes a quick friend with Mildred and will be really someone very instrumental in Mildred's life. Next slide, please. Dorothy will introduce Mildred to um, the Carl Dobrinsky family. And Esther, the mother, had been Dorothy Harder's English teacher at Lorraine High School in Lorraine, Kansas, when Dorothy was in high school. And so um, Esther, by this time, has two young children and has left the classroom to be a mother and rear her children. And so the Dobrinskys very kindly agree to let Mildred come live with them. And Mildred will um, be with them and be almost like a, another member of the family for the next four years. Um, so Mildred will start high school at age 18 in the ninth grade. At this time, um, in Germany during World War II, if you were a German citizen and your family was not a Nazi supporter or sympathizer, then you left school, your educational career ended in the eighth grade. It was only people that were members of the Nazi party or had ties that way that went on for further education. Factors that I think that helped Mildred succeed in high school, first of all, she had a tremendous will to succeed. But it was a very small school in a small farming community, not unlike Radock, where she had grown up in Germany. Lorraine is also a part of Kansas that was settled by German immigrants. And so there were a lot of people of similar background. She had a very dedicated faculty and staff and a very welcoming and friendly student body. And four years later, on May 15th, um, 1951, Mildred will graduate from Lorraine High School and then immediately begin work at Lorraine State Bank, which will um, turn into a very storied and um, wonderful 32-year career with that entity. Next slide. While in high school, and I'm convinced that he saw her long before she saw him. They also attended the same church, First Baptist Church in Lorraine. But Leon Jansen, a local farmer who had graduated from um, Lorraine High School a few years 
before um, began dating Mildred. And so in Christmas of 1951, they get engaged. And then almost a year and a half later, on May 2nd of 1953, Mildred and Leon marry. Mutti was not able to be there that day. And I know that was a very bittersweet um, occasion. So happy for Mildred and Leon to be married, but her mom and brother were not there. But it will be, next slide, um, five months later, um, that October, when Mutti and Horst are finally, with a lot of help from Mildred and a lot of other people, able to leave Germany. And um, on that morning, this was a Thursday, they will um, go meet um, Leon and Mildred will go meet her mother and her brother in Hutchison at the train station on the Santa Fe Express and all be back together again. Next slide. The Jansons will go on to have four children. They have two daughters and two sons, Karen, Kenton, Susan, and Galen. Mildred has six grandchildren and four great-grandchildren and a fifth great-grandchild that's on the way um, in two months in March. Next slide, please. You know, having the privilege of getting to tell this story for Mildred, but also trying to be more objective and take a step back and and I think that's natural for a reader or someone listening to this program tonight. You know, how did Mildred survive? I think Mildred, first of all, she learned very quickly in those three months when the Russians took her family, um, when she was at the laundry camp, when she was looking for her mother and her brother, she learned to find her voice. She learned to speak up for herself. She also had faith in God. She had seen that mirrored in her home, in her parents, and then accepted that for herself. She was also very, um, she had perseverance. She had the ability to keep on keeping on. She also, Mildred has a very resilient, a very sort of flexible, as it were, spirit. Um, but I think for me, the most important key to Mildred's successful is her determination to choose joy. She is one of the most joy-filled people I've ever had the privilege of meeting. And she, of anyone I know, has every reason to be bitter or angry. But she's made that decision with her heart um, to get up every day. And I think it's just for me, it's great encouragement that I have that same choice every day. Next slide, please. As Trey mentioned at the first of the program, a relative of Mildred's cousin, this lovely lady here, Jean Binky, who was Leon Jansen's cousin, is Leon Jansen's cousin. I met her in June of 2010 on a trip to Europe. And so we palled around. I was with, there with my mother and Jean was there with some other lady friends and we just spent time together but in the years since then we kept in touch and as my writing career grew I would send copies of books to Jean she was a former American history teacher I was still in the classroom we both learned to read we had a lot of common ground but she was the one who was so kind to share my name um, with the family next slide please so on October 10th, 2019, um, this is the first day that Mildred and I met, and it was just such a, a wonderful day. My life has been tremendously blessed since then, but I was spent four days on ground in Ellsworth, Kansas, right in the middle of the state where Mildred lives. And as Trey mentioned, we recorded 11 hours of interviews and then came home to Mississippi to write the book. It took us four and a half months to write the story, 732 hours, 43 minutes. Next slide, please. There were a lot of challenges of writing the story. Um, first of all, I needed to learn all that I could about Mildred. You can see her at her dining room table. Um, you know, that was that was one of the challenges was just sheer geography. She's in Ellsworth. I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, halfway across the country and the other photos on this slide are my son's uh, bedroom across the hall from mine he is married with uh, four children of his own and but I had um, sort of um, commandeered his bedroom and set up a um, a table there you can see my work desk I set up next to the bed and then used my um, cutting board I'm a quilter and so set that out and then put all the notebooks and all the documents that I was trying to sift through and that was kind of command central 
during these um, these months, but I had to learn all that I could about Mildred. I was um, privileged. Again, Susan, her daughter, and her entire family were so kind to provide me with just so much information. But the interviews, I had access to a lot of previously uh, recorded interviews of her, some that were on CDs, a lot of written question and answers. We worked a lot by email. There was also a wonderful collection of newspaper articles. That was the first thing Susan gave to me uh, when we I first met her. Articles written between 1947 when Mildred arrived in the United States through the early 2000s that were a gold mine of information about her. I also had to learn all that I could about the World War II period. And as I told you, even though I had been a history teacher and studied this, um, this was a niche of the war. This was a part of this greater story that I had to learn. I also had to find a pattern for writing a memoir. I'd never written a memoir of this genre before. Um, a great friend, Ken Geyer, who's a fellow writer, um, had written at the time two years prior to this, um, a World War II book I can highly recommend called All the Gallant Men. That is the story of Donald Stratton, who was one of the last five survivors of the sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. But Ken was a wonderful guide and gave me great advice. Ken also graciously wrote the foreword to the book. I also had to learn to write in the voice of another person. And that was probably, I think, the greatest challenge for this book. We did it. We worked very closely with Mildred and Karen, her other daughter, and Susan. Every time I would get five chapters written, I would put those together in a document I called a bundle, and we'd send the bundle, and they would edit. And invariably, I'd get a phone call or an email, you know, the dress is blue, you listed it as red, or mother wouldn't use this word, or here's a better way to say what she would have said. So I think that was another help to have direct access to her. And then there was also an enormous amount of historical research um, that we put together that I wanted the readers to understand. I didn't feel like you could talk about the story without understanding the greater backdrop of history. Um, next slide, please. The lessons that Mildred has taught me. The first one is it's never too late. And to encourage those of you that are joining us tonight, you may have a dream, whatever it is. It, it may be small or it may be great, but it's never too late. Mildred was 90 and a half years old when we first met. Um, also, don't give up on your dreams. Um, as a writer, I had had a lot of dreams and Mildred and her family had been wanting, hoping to see this book, I mean, this story become a, a more substantive form. Also, this book taught both me and Mildred that um, old dogs can learn new tricks. Um, I was in my mid-40s, I think, if I have to go back and remember when I went to graduate school and I first learned that lesson there, but certainly um, you know, as we get older, we get better and we get wiser, but it was, it is nice to learn newer things as you get older. Also, Mildred has taught me to center your life's work around something that moves you. Um, Mildred, certainly her primary um, love was her family and her responsibility to her husband and her children, but she also had a wonderful career with Lorraine State Bank for 32 years, very active in her church and her greater community, but this lady gets up every day, puts her feet on the floor, and is ready to find something new to do, and is moved by that, has so much purpose, and that's been great inspiration for me. And also that God is full of surprises. There was no way I could have foreseen or even predicted this wonderful um, occurrence of getting to share her story. Next slide, please. In the last year, in fact, about this time last year, our publisher, we were very um, thankful that they uh, published two new editions of Mildred's story. The first on your left is the education edition, which is used obviously for classrooms. And then the faith-based edition has all the educational components, but does include a Bible study and a collection of prayers um, from Muti, Mildred's mother. Next slide. This is the first quote I ever read. Uh, I think some of the first words of Mildred's I ever read, they were in that very first newspaper article that I read about Mildred. When Mildred gets into Kansas in 1947 and people, 
remember she will start high school that fall, but by the next year, by the end of her ninth grade year, but now she is now 19 years old, she becomes somewhat of a well-known celebrity in this part of Kansas and will do a lot of speaking and public appearances. But I love this quote. It says, do you who live in America really appreciate your freedom? You are the most blessed and fortunate people on earth. And I think especially at the place where we are in American history today, no truer words were spoken. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Mildred Schindler Jansen, an American heroine. Hello, Mildred. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, Sherry, thank you so much for uh, detailing um, uh, Mildred's story. And uh, before we get started with any questions, I'll give people some time to start typing them in. Uh, I'd like to share uh, first a link to the documentary that was uh, created. It's fantastic. Uh, it's just a little over 20 minutes, so it's it's very, very digestible. Um, so here is a link to that video if you haven't seen it, and here is a link to Sherry's website where you can purchase your very own copy. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll get started on some on some questions this evening. Um, the first one, um, Mildred, had you always wanted to uh, have a to write a book to detail your life story? Um, was this something that you'd always kind of had the idea of? Oh, no, no. <laughs> At age 88, I started writing down. I took a tablet and I started writing down for my grandchildren. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted my grandchildren to know where their grandma came from. And so I had about 10 pages. I just at 88, I thought, before I forget about this, I better write it down. And that's when I started doing this for my grandchildren. I had no idea that this ever could happen. And I am so glad we did this, Sherry, because the schools, i that's where I want to be is go to schools. I went to schools and those seventh and eighth graders, sixth graders, they just, the questions they had and some of the things, would this be the term? I went to Lyons. This was a year ago in May. And they read the teacher, the Holocaust teacher, read the book to them. And our oldest daughter, Karen, found out that she was reading the book to the seventh graders. She says, Mom, I'm going to buy 25 books and take it to them because she worked in Lyons for a lady. And they were so excited when they got the books. They got to follow along. After they finished reading, they had me come to visit and answer questions. At the end, there was 30 in each class, 30 and then another 30. And I thought, my I told my Sunday school class, please pray for me. I'm going to talk to seventh graders. <laughs> and having raised four seventh graders, I didn't know what I was going to get myself into. They just sat there spellbound. I have never, I did not expect that. That was just, I couldn't believe it. Susan, you were with me. <laughs> At the end of that, they gave me a box of blessings. It's a box, a little box like cards, playing cards. And on the front, on the front, it had scripture. And on the back, they all wrote me a note. Mm -hmm. And here are some of the things. It touched my heart. Oh, hello. You inspire me to be better. You help me trust again. These are seventh graders. You gave me hope. 
God had a purpose for you. You made me cry and smile. I hope your story gets told to more kids like me. And that just touched my heart. And therefore, I want to get to more schools. <laughs> just talk to them. And, and the questions they have, they're just one of the little and the little guys in six, he was a sixth grader. And there was 80 of them in this gym. Way in the back, he got up right away and he said, I am so sorry you had to go through this. And I wanted to go over there and give him a big hug, but I didn't want to embarrass him. He was <laughs> way in the back. He was not very tall. I mean, there was some. And then I want to tell you that I signed some athlete shoes. <laughs> They they came with their shoes and they had me sign their shoes. And I says, wait a minute, wait a minute. After five or six, I said, I will send you book plates and then scraps of paper. I will send you book plates with my name on it and you can paste it anywhere. They're sticky no, like sticky notes. You can paste them in your books or wherever you want to paste them. And so I had to sign 85 for that school. Wow. And Sherry, when you were here with me at Lions, I signed 180. Wow. And <laughs> we were in Lions together and send it to him. I kept the sign and I kept the sign and and the I told him I give it because the, he come to me, had a white shirt on, he says, and a pen, and he says, will you sign this, my shirt? I says, your mom wouldn't like that. <laughs> me, me putting you in um, with pen, ballpoint pen. And so I said, I'll send you book plates. And then I asked the teacher how many she needed, 180. <laughs> so that kept me busy. But I... That's where I want to be. I want to tell the young people that this can happen here. Are there other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was an in incredible response. Um, and those those students are incredibly fortunate to to be able to to hear from you. It is it's not every day. It's easy to read about something in a book, but it's not it's not every day that you meet. The primary source themselves. So what what you're doing is absolutely incredible. So thank you very much. And I'm much. so grateful I'm still <laughs> able to do it. <clears throat> we have uh, a question from Cody here uh, is asking, uh, during the war, what was your day to day life like? When? During uh, the war. So during World War Two. So bef before you you were forcibly removed from your home. I think is well, what he's asking. When when I was growing up, we were just on a farm and we lived a normal life and never, never thought that this would happen to us. But once the Russians came in, it all changed. When the war was going on, did your parents ever talk about, you know, the, the developments or did they kind of hide that from you? No, my mother and dad never talked to us about anything. We did not know what happened to the Jews until I came over to the United States. I did not even know there were camps. All we had was radios. And my dad, see, when they tried to take Hitler's life several times, my dad came in and bent over the radio. And he says, they missed him again. They missed him again. He wanted them gone. He had been in the United States eight years, so they were watching him close. So he had to be very careful that he didn't talk to people. And he and my mother never talked to us children about that, about the war, about what was going on. We did not know anything. And Hitler told us exactly what he wanted us to know on the radio. 
Wow. So I'm I'm sure when you were taken from your home, that was a even bigger surprise than if you had been kind of following along to it. Um, so we've got a, a comment from Al here. Um, read, read your book last year and shared with friends. So well, thank you so much, Al, for, for reading and sharing this uh, very important message. Um, you are so welcome. <laughs> um, so when you were kind of moving from town to town after you had been taken, uh, what were the the what was the setting like? Were was there a lot of destruction, um, a lot of um, kind of famine and a war torn Europe? Well, you can imagine when you have horses and wagons going with all these people and soldiers on each side taking you from town to town. Our towns are just like a mile and a mile and a half apart, not like here, because all we do is go by bicycle or walk or horse and wagon. So our towns are closer together. So they took our town and we moved they always moved us northeast. They said they were going to move us to Poland and on to Russia. And they kept us moving that direction, north, always moving toward that Poland. And every time we moved, there were more people, every town. See, they moved everyone in town. So you can imagine what this was like. And then we saw grandparents die. And that was so cold, it was February. And they would lay them in a road ditch and cover them with a blanket. And they couldn't even tell them bye because they, uh, the soldiers with the guns, go, go. And babies, it was just too cold for babies and many babies died. And my brother and I had to see that. And I don't know, I said my brother was 15 and I says, I just can't imagine with a special man he grew up to be what with what he saw as a young boy. When about the rebel when you were coming back from the wash camp, did you see any rebel? Not too much. Oh, some of the how our house when we first the first day when we went out to see, find my mother and dad from town, uh, there was a big hole in the roof and those kind of things. We saw where a cannon had hit the roof and big hole. Some, not because they were small towns. Now, when I finally went to Berlin, that was just blocks and blocks just rebel, blocks. It was just blocked off. And that was, that was, that, look terrible, like there was nothing left. Or oh, how can people live here? I thought when I moved in. So what um I'm sure it was probably very difficult or impossible for you to get a good meal throughout your journey. What or what kind of things would you eat uh when you did have a moment? Um you know my mother I remember she cooked grass. She, if I tell the, I told it, the girls in school when I talked to different clubs, I says, if you don't like spinach, try eating grass. Oh. My mother would cook grass, and then she'd take some of those, the cattle lick on squ uh, squares of salt, and that's what my mother shaved off some and put in that. It didn't taste very good, but it was something to eat. And mostly along the way, as we were going from the camp to the permanent place where we finally lived, we had a lot of potatoes. And we would go to a field and, and get, get some potatoes, and we eat a lot of potatoes. And just to put a little salt on it, and that, that was good. Somehow, I wonder if my mother went hungry just to give us some food. I don't like that in my eyes. Sorry. Yeah. But oh. somehow we lived. My mother was not well. And when the Poles came, 
and told us that we had to get out. After being back home two months, they told they came in and I said, well, my mother's not feeling very well. And he, and can, oh, they wanted, if you're going to stay here, you have to become Polish citizen because Russia gave that part of Germany to Poland. And if you're going to stay, you have to speak Polish and become Polish citizen. And my mother said, can we tell, can we wait till tomorrow? Yes, we'll be back tomorrow. They came back and I said, well, my mother still is not feeling well. My mother was 46 at the time. And he's one of the soldiers says, well, I'll just shoot her. Can you imagine somebody that's 13 and 15 Tell them they're going to shoot your mother and your dad is gone. You don't know. He never came back. So, But somehow we survived and my mother, I don't know how she thought, dreamt. Looks like we're experiencing a, a tiny and, bit of uh and they look and then she put flour on my face because I had rosy cheeks and they would say she's sick and leave me alone. Tell them about the buried food in the buried food in the barn. Oh yes and before the Russians came we buried food in the barn and uh, canned food bacon, ham that we cured, of course, it was all cured, buried that in the barn. And when we got back, my mother said, we will go see if, if, if we got the food here yet. And we did find it. They did not find it. They buried it in the barn under hay and straw, dug a hole, put dirt on it, and then hay and straw. So they did not find that. And we had that, my mother says, we will use as little as possible every day a little bit so it lasts a long time. Then when the poles came, we had to leave most of it. We took some with us, but we couldn't take it all. Well, we have a, um, a middle school history teacher here that is uh, is viewing. Um, and they are uh, their class is currently reading parts of your story, um, and their students are very moved uh, by what you've said. Um, and they ask, "What would be one part of your story or lesson that you would like them to focus on with their students?" That history could repeat itself. I want them to know to to pay attention to the in the history classes or when they learn about history, pay attention because this could happen. We saw it happen in Ukraine. I was going to exercise and one of the ladies said to me, she said, that morning when we heard on the news that Ukraine they had invaded. invaded Ukraine, Mildred, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not. There they go again. And it looked at those pictures looked exactly like what we've been through. And I says, I want our young people to pay attention that this can happen again. And it did happen again. Very, very powerful and, and unfortunately true statement. But it is it is easy when you read about something it, in a history book that that happened a long time ago. And. Yeah, those those people aren't anything like we are today. And the more no. that you learn history, the more you realize, like Sherry said in her presentation, we humans have always been the same way we are today. It's just what we have access to that changes it. So that's right. Yeah. Um, but they're not they say we don't want our young people to know that's too painful. No, it's real. It may be painful, but it's real. It was real. Well, that makes me uh, wonder, with your own children, uh, when they were growing up, did you talk about your experiences or did you try to 
kind of shy away from them. I did not. Muti did. My, Muti did. Yeah, my mother did. Muti did when she came. She talked. She, the children would just sit there and listen to her, she and she would just. She, she, my mother did, yes, and she just told such details, but I did not. And I did not teach my children German. I had such a hard time learning English. Why do I want them? Why do I want to speak German to them? Because I had a hard time. Mind you, I was 18 years old when I started high school. And if it wasn't for a small school, you saw how few we were graduates. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for a small school, I would have never made it. I was 18, but I graduated when I was 22 and got a job working in the bank. My superintendent said, Mildred, I don't know about you working in the bank. <laughs> I says, I'll show you. I can do it. And he would come every Monday morning. He'd come in with a church offering. He was a church treasurer. And I said, Mr. Meacham, what do you think? Well, he says, I think you're going to do it. I says, I don't need algebra and geometry. I know how to subtract and add. <laughs> and that's all I need to know. <laughs> and I, I, I loved my job. I, I worked there for 30 years. I worked before I was married, and when I had children, I stayed home till they went to school, and then I started back in a bank again, the same bank. So we just lived four miles from town, so that was easy for me to get there, and I enjoyed it, and I knew all my customers by name. And some of them spoke German. Oh, of course. I had some coming in and they said, oh, Mildred, here's your favorite customer. He came, they came from several towns away. And when they walked in and the girls would say, Mildred, here's your customer. And of course, I go wait on him. And of course, we always had to talk German, too. So. Say something in German. What? Say something in German. Ich kann Deutsch sprechen. Ich kann, ich kann Deutsch sprechen. And then when somebody sneezes, you say Gesundheit, good health. And I said to my boss's daughter that worked in the summer, and she went to college and she was working in the summer in the bank. And I said, um, somebody sneezed and I said Gesundheit and she had that down. And then I said, I tell you something else. Gesundheit is besser than Krankheit. Good health is better than sickness. Before the summer was over, she had it. She owns a pharmacy in a couple towns down. And when I go see her, I walk in and I said, Gesundheit is besser than Krankheit. And she said, Mildred. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so, so sweet. Um we had a, a, a question if uh, if you had ever uh, traveled back home um, after since you've been in Kansas. Yes, I've been back. We went back, but there is there were no buildings standing, and uh, your, but we went farm. back and a um, white lilac bush and an apple tree was the only thing, and I. I couldn't even see where the buildings were. My dad had buried guns before the Russians came because we were afraid we we shouldn't have guns. And so he buried them. I couldn't even tell you which building in a basement. He buried them in one of his shop basement. And I couldn't even tell you which, if the build, the buildings were all gone, so. And then Susan yeah. went last summer. Was it last summer? Yeah. She went last summer with a cousin to my home place. Mm -hmm. When um, when you were traveling to the United States um, on your own, I, I'm sure that that was very scary. Uh, it was. Um, 
were were you did you feel at the time that you were kind of just caught up in this whirlwind I mean did you have enough time to process everything that was happening or were you just kind no. of looking towards the future no no I got off the boat I didn't know one soul on the ship I got off I stood there and I thought, who is going to help me to get to, I'm I'm 15 years old. At that time, I was 16, well, 17, 17, because I turned 16 when the Russians came, and I was 17. Who is going to help me to get to Great Bend, Kansas, to my aunt and uncle? I cannot speak English. And then all at once, I saw a sign go up, Mildred Schindler. And they were friends of friends that helped me, a husband and wife. And I stayed with them for a couple of days. And then uh, they helped me. And I got on a, on a train and I looked at the menu the next morning. They told me, the interpreter said, I should go eat breakfast. And so the conductor come around and he says to me, eat. He goes like this, eat. And I shook my head and showed him I had fruits, fruits, nuts, candy bars. And he just shook his head and grabbed me by the hand and took me through six cars to the dining car. I get to the dining car and I'm standing there and I see people sitting here and here. And I turned around and he's gone. He left me standing there. <laughs> now what am I going to do? I sit finally sit down and I order. I looked at the menu. I think I must have had it upside down. It all looked the same. So I saw the word eggs. My mother and my father spoke English when they didn't want us kids to know something <laughs> in Germany. And so she would say in German, go get, and then she would say eggs. She didn't say eggs. She said eggs. And that word right there, there was a, that looked like eggs. So I wrote down two fried eggs. I wondered if they were poached or boiled or what they're going to be when I get them. I got orange juice, I got toast, and I got two fried eggs. And I learned a new word, fried. <laughs> I wanted pancakes so bad. There was a man eating pancakes. I wanted one of them so bad, but I didn't know what they what what they call this. You know what I would do today? Yeah. I would walk over there and I would say, <laughs> I want this. But I was too scared. Mm -hmm. Not today, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so very much for taking the time to do this. Um, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sharon. We are so fortunate. Um, and I, I will say, I'm so glad that I got to meet you in person um, a few you. months ago. And when you said that uh, you wish you could have hugged that, that small boy, um, I greatly appreciate that I got the chance to, to get a hug like that as well. Cause that, <laughs> That uh, I'll I'll always remember that. So so thank you, Mildred. <laughs> well, um, well, Sherry, Susan, Mildred, thank you all uh, again. Um, and I hope everyone can join us next month for our next program on February fourteenth uh, to hear Marla Day present "Dress for Success: Nellie Dawn in American Fashion." Uh, so from all of us here at Museum After Hours. Thank you so much, and uh, please take care. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Zane. Thank you, Zane.